Okay, let's go then. Uh, hi, my name is Tråke Fransson. Uh, I will present to you uh, an example of how Puppet is used in a uh, very large and distributed organization. Uh, it's a case study that a, uh, a current customer uh, has allowed me to present here, provided that I don't mention their name, unfortunately. So you will, uh, I will leave that uh, for you to guess which one it is. Um, but first, who am I? Uh, uh, and where? what's my background? Uh, I've been working with Linux uh, and open source software for about 13 years, uh, building systems. And since I started working for uh, Redbridge a few years ago, uh, building systems that manages systems and train people how to use them. Uh, Redbridge is a company that was started with the idea to build stuff with the open source and by with stuff, uh, I mean all kinds of uh, uh, boring administrative uh, business systems or even more unsexy, uh, the infrastructure for boring administrative systems. Maybe that's why there's I, I feel that you maybe we're on the same page. That's maybe why there's no women here at all. <laughs> this is, sorry, that, why, that's why there's only one here. And, and she's paid to be here. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, even, even though the, the things that we work with are pretty boring, uh, at least I think that the technology that we work with uh, is a little bit, or it is sexy. It is, uh, we work with the cloud stuff, with the stacks that, uh, the complex systems uh, to make things like uh, uh, Amazon and, and, and those kinds of, of uh, really big systems take over. Uh, and one of those systems is Puppet. So uh, that's that's about me then, uh, or rather more about Redbridge. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it short. Uh, I've uh, divided this presentation. It's it's going to be PowerPoint poisoning, uh, but I've, it's uh, there's some kind of structure here. Uh, we have uh, uh, it's three parts. In the first part, I I, I talk about uh, the customer who is not to be named. Uh, and I will also uh, kind of, uh, I will say what the actual, what the, what the problem is and trying to, to uh, get that down. Uh, in part of two, in part two uh, uh, I will focus a little bit more on the soft uh, issues, uh, the, the way of working, uh, which has been the greatest challenge in this. Uh, and uh, to just to keep you to the end, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the technical platform in part three. So that's it. Uh, the case. As I said, I'm not allowed to say which company I'm talking about. Uh, it's, it's not that it's ever anything secret or anything. Uh, this is a, it's a big telecommunications company. Uh, Swedish, uh, based in Shista. <coughs> uh, the thing is that we, we don't we don't want to up, bother upper management with this and uh, the press officer and so on, uh, just to get this presentation through. Because then I would have started like six months ago to, just to get these thirty slides uh, knowledge. Um, well, uh, they're interesting in that they are, uh, this customer has uh, around 10 main sites around the world. I, I checked for the, for the time zones and they're spread in, in 16, over 16 different time zones. Uh, so uh, they, they talk about uh, someone else at this company has looked at this and they say, oh, we want to use uh, follow the sun at least for 16 hours, and then for eight hours we sleep. 
Uh, but we have 10 sites around the world. Uh, on those sites, uh, I, we, there are thousands upon thousands of users, uh, and there are thousands, uh, at least, uh, of systems. There is uh, I, something that uh, struck me while I was listening to the other guy's presentation was that they said that, okay, with, we are a Debian shop. Uh, that, uh, there are uh, a lot to gain from being able to run just one or two operating systems. Uh, but this company, they can't do that. Uh, they have to use all of these different operating systems. And they have to have uh, servers running all of these operating systems. Uh, there are virtual uh, and uh, both virtual and metal servers. Virtual servers from different using different uh, hypervisors, uh, and on those servers they run SUSE, uh, at least three different versions of SUSE every day. Uh, also 32 and 64 bit, so that makes more combinations. Uh, they use Red Hat and CentOS. Uh, both 5 and 6, also 32 and 64 bit, so that's a little bit uh, more uh, combinations. And they also uh, use Ubuntu, of course, uh, and Solaris 8, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, <laughs> so that poses a challenge, uh, which I will maybe go into a little bit more later. Uh, on these servers, there, there's nothing, um, or at least the, the things that, that this project uh, is about, there, there's not no really uh, special applications, and they don't run very much in-house applications. Uh, mostly they, they have a stack that is based on, on uh, open source and uh, and closed source third party software. Uh, the the users are, are in different divisions uh, and they uh, choose from from predefined system types. They say, okay, we want to use uh, uh, this this kind of server or these kinds of servers on these operating systems. Uh, but they choose from from more or less from a from a palette of different uh, things for the systems. There are some unique applications that they say, okay, but in addition to this, uh, we also want to run this application from this vendor on here. Um, for uh, supporting all of this, uh, this kinds of service, apart from obviously Puppet, uh, there is some uh, supporting infrastructure as well. Uh, of course, since you have Red Hat, they have uh, a few satellite installations. Uh, and uh, same thing for uh, Solaris. I think it's called Ops Center, Ops Center of course. Uh, and the same for the other operating systems. Uh, and they also use uh, to not have to push every application onto every platform. They also use a, a big uh, network file system called AFS. So now you probably know which customer I am talking about. So the, the challenge was uh, a pretty big one. Uh, about a decade ago, I don't know exactly when, they, they outsourced everything. They said, this big mess is too big and too messy. Let's give it to someone else and let it be their headache. Uh, but now the pendulum has swung back, and they they say, okay, we can we can probably do this uh, a little bit better and cheaper. Uh, because I mean, it shouldn't take 18 weeks to get the virtual server with some software on it. Uh, well, that, that sets the bar pretty low. That's not what we're aiming for. Uh, they also wanted to uh, increase uh, cost efficiency because they knew what it was like to be, before they outsourced everything. They knew how much, if they just would 
go back to that and scale that organization up, it would be very expensive for them. Uh, so what we need to do is, uh, our goal was that uh, we should, uh, the administrators should only solve each problem once, globally, on all sides, uh, and then share this solution. And, well, uh, uh, that's about it about, I want to say about that. <clears throat> Uh, there are also some additional requirements, uh, it, it, and that is that uh, that is a little bit more like a people uh, thing. We don't want to make uh, all of these sites, they have their own system administrators, which are experts at different systems. Uh, and we don't want to... Uh, from, from and to gather all the system administrators from all the time zones and have them work under like a central uh, organization because that was would just be uh, inefficient and and well it, it then it would take eighteen weeks to get out of virtual server probably so uh, we should leverage the existing expertise if there's an expert somewhere uh, we're going to keep him there. <clears throat> Uh, and we're going to use him. Uh, we also uh, know that the users are close to their site. Uh, so each site has their own users. So it's better to have uh, administrators working with the system close to their users. Uh, be close to your market. Uh, so, so we should let them uh, solve their own uh, problems uh, as they, uh, because they are the best at solving it. But we should try to get this solution back and share it. Uh, also, the, uh, this, the deciding, uh, when you decide on, on a change uh, in, in this company, uh, they, it works, it, they use the ITIL, so uh, with, an addition that you can ask the customer who uses the server and say, please, uh, may I reboot this server? Uh, and they can click no. And then you can ask them again in a week, may I, can I please reboot this server? Uh, so it, it's a very important that it's difficult enough as it is, as it is to, to, uh, to get changes done. <clears throat> so we want to keep that uh, freedom as well. So, where does Puppet come into all this? Well, uh, it's a tool for system administrators uh, uh, in this case. Uh, and it's only part of the, uh, of the solution that they are bringing out worldwide. But it's a very important uh, focal point as uh, all of the services that they use will need to be uh, puppetized uh, somehow. <clears throat> Uh, if an application or service isn't properly architected or documented, then uh, we'll, we'll notice it, uh, if, if not sooner, then we'll notice it when we have to write the Puppet module or Puppet manifest to roll that service out. Uh, so uh, that makes it like a cutting edge. That leads me on to part two then. So uh, with Given that problem, uh, how, what is the solution? Well, the solution is partly technical, uh, but mostly uh, finding a way of working. Uh, and in, in this case, uh, when I say code, uh, I, I, say I mean puppet code. Uh, why and, and when is the code developed? Uh, by whom and how do we share it? That's our way of working. Uh, and this, the facilitator here uh, is a, glo the, a global team which is supposed to coordinate this development. Uh, I don't really know this. I was forced to put this image here because you should have fun images. Uh, well, anyway. Uh, this global team is a little bit like this guy. Uh, we have to know uh, all of the services and we have to know everybody everywhere 
to be able to help them to make puppet code. But we are not uh, the ones who developed the code um, because we remember the slide where I said we should leverage existing expertise. So if we have an expert somewhere else, he should develop the code. Uh, so what we should do as a, as a, as a global team is uh, uh, really find out who knows what about what uh, and make sure that this knowledge is shared. Uh, there's, uh, we, since we need to share the puppet code, we have to have some kind of code standard. The global team will be the keeper of this code standard. Uh, and we will also uh, develop and support the puppet architecture. So this is, uh, this is an example of, of how code development or puppet code development happens. Uh, site users on one of the 10 sites, uh, they need a service configured. They say, we want hosted Jenkins and we need you administrators to set it up. So this, the site team uh, in despair uh, calls out to, uh, to the global team for puppet code and say, we need puppet code for this thing. We don't really know what it is. Do you guys know anyone who knows this? So the global team then uh, asks around a little bit and finds uh, some kind of uh, Jenkins expert. He may not be the best at writing puppet code, but he, he is very good at Jenkins. So we, we uh, from the global team, we help him write a module that will work, uh, hopefully, uh, for the ones who ask for it and also globally. And then uh, we deliver it to the site team and users and everybody's happy. Here's another example. Uh, site, needs a, need, site users again need some kind of service, uh, but this time they have an expert locally on the site. So we're gonna leverage him. Uh, uh, he leverages himself. He just writes a puppet module and says, by the way, guys, I wrote a puppet module for this. If, if you need it, uh, here it is. Uh, so then the global team uh, takes this knowledge and keeps it. And next time someone asks for a hosted Tomcat puppet module, then uh, we take up this code, make sure it's still OK, and then give it to them. Uh, how many of you are familiar with using flow charts? Uh, flow charts works best for programmers and programmers who write like the old fashioned kind of programs. Uh, I found that none of the, uh, the, uh, management of this project really understands uh, flowcharts. To me, it's really, really simple. Uh, we have some kind of, uh, someone needs code. Uh, do we have global code? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, the, first, the team who needs it, well, get the code. Is it okay? Yes, use it, done. Uh, and then we have, uh, we, we can go in different directions here, but uh, need code? Uh, no, there is there is no code for this. So then the global team, uh, as I showed in the previous examples, they ask around, are there, do anyone have any code for this? Uh, and the answer is no, there isn't. And then we need to find this expert and develop this code and uh, test it and so on. And But finally, we'll get back down here to the deploy where we want to be. So uh, how do we do this code sharing uh, technically? Uh, well, there is uh, global Git repositories, a lot of them. Uh, they have like, uh, they have a, a Garrett uh, installation, uh, which all of, everyone in the company can use. Uh, and what you do is we, we have this global repository, uh, which everyone knows where it is. Uh, but uh, when you're, before you deploy code, uh, you first take it from there, pull it down locally, and deploy from your local copy. 
because remember we, we don't want to centralize things. Uh, this is a this really is about trust uh, to trust someone uh, who you don't know who works on an office in a different time zone somewhere. Uh, that's that's a really I've seen this worry. They say, but what if someone commits some code that doesn't work? And I said, okay, that's okay because. Uh, he will commit to his local repository, you won't even see the code. Uh, once you have gotten the, the code to your uh, local site, then it's locally tested before you deploy it, before they deploy it. They are still responsible. We aren't responsible for any of the code. It may set your server on fire or not. Uh, and then they do an ITIL change uh, and, and just deploy the code. Uh, and when they do any uh, changes to the code, they are supposed to notify the global team and say, by the way, that, that code didn't have support for Solaris 8, 32 bit, and we added that. Uh, and the global team said, oh, great, this is something that we really need. Uh, so they just pull that code from the repository back up to the global repository. So, uh, the code standard, uh, uh, well, the, there is, I think the, the previous presenters have already spoken about this, how you structure the code and so on. So it, it's not uh, uh, so interesting uh, to, to repeat. One thing though, is a, is a unit test. Uh, uh, that we have added to the code standard. Um, that I will go into that uh, a little bit later, why we have that. Uh, this is a repeat of, was it the Craig's uh, with the roles and stuff? Uh, we do pretty much the same. Uh, the readme. Uh, one thing to, to add about the readme, uh, there used to be, uh, well, in the readme, well, where do you document all the parameters to a mod to a parameterized module? Well, you can do it in the readme, uh, but that didn't get updated. So uh, we, we stopped doing that. So now we just do it in init uh, TP where they have to be. So you have to write it in there. And if you change the name of a variable, you have to change it in there. So just put the documentation there as well. Uh, and another thing about the code standard uh, that is uh, that we need to worry about is that we have to have uh, nice results. If since we have to support ten different uh, sites with a number of environments each, uh, and there are so many different operating systems. It, it, the code can set your server on fire if we're unlucky. Uh, so, if we are, uh, don't just assume something. If you're, if there's a, uh, a choice uh, somewhere which you uh, which you don't know about, then fail and not notify the administrator. Say. Sorry, uh, we haven't tested this operating system yet. Uh, for, the, for the code review, um, uh, this is uh, again to have some kind of a way of uh, tackle that fear of what if someone commits something that breaks things. Uh, well, we, we put the code review in place. Uh, and that is that the, the, the global team uh, uh, both accepts code and sends code for review. Uh, we can send it out to the sites and say, uh, because we know everyone on all the sites, we can send it out to a guy in China and say, please, can you look at this code? Test it on your site. Uh, we, we, we need this, an extra set of eyes on this code. And he puts it on his test environment and tests it. Uh, and what what we really want to be sure that it it does is that it doesn't break anything uh, horribly. 
and that's our that's our success criteria. So uh, if 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 the, you can't read the code, then that's a fail. Uh, and it's, if it breaks other modules, then that's also a fail. And how do we know that it has broken other modules? Well, because there is a small unit test for each module that says, okay, this, uh, this module did its job, it worked. Uh, having a standard is fine, uh, but there is also the small matter of uh, adhering to this standard. And what, what we have here is, uh, we're very far from being DevOps. I don't think we have a single developer in this project. Uh, they're all system administrators. System administrators aren't familiar with peer review. They don't know Scrum. They don't know extreme programming. They uh, may have heard about unit tests. Uh, they rarely use, well, they probably use Git, maybe. Uh, so this is also something to take into consideration. We can't really have uh, build fancy structures that are difficult to work with. It has to be pretty basic. It shouldn't, uh, to get going, you shouldn't be uh, assumed to uh, have any other tools but VI. And then I don't mean Vim, I mean VI. Uh, and all the other gaps, the global team has to take care of and fill. If there's a, if there's a guy, he's very, very good at Jenkins, but he doesn't know anything about Git, like that's ever going to happen, uh, then the global team has to go in there and, and help him and teach him. This is the way you use Git. Uh, and we know nothing about Jenkins, so uh, we'll, we'll have to uh, learn that as well in the process. Uh, to, to further lower the bar for, for uh, code contribution, we, we've written a, a, a boilerplate module. Uh, it's, a, it's a module that contains everything uh, that you need. So the structure and, and the readme and everything, and uh, it's commented here you put your parameters. You document your parameters by writing so and so. So what they have to do is just copy this, pull this module, uh, rename it, add some their code to it, and then they can push it back. I I'm not sure I want to go here. Uh, how uh, this is a very complicated thing, uh, which we just started discussing a few days ago, and that is how are we going to do. Uh, I mean, patching uh, Puppet Manifest is almost like patching anything else. Uh, it, you have to choose whether you want to stay with the main line or if you uh, want to keep with what you have that is stable. And, and uh, once you need a certain feature, then you'll take the extra, uh, extra work of uh, uh, testing it because you have to test it. Uh, there is there is uh, no way of uh, well, of course, if you want to, everything is possible. But I mean, we have ten sites. Uh, we have seven different OSS, major uh, audio OSS, uh, of of which there are two or three versions. Uh, I mean, it, it, it creates so many combinations. So it's uh, you would have to have an automated system to to test it. And you will have to have an automated system in each of these 10 sites. So, uh, but maybe we'll build it. We don't know. <clears throat> Could have something like uh, Jenkins starting up a lot of uh, virtual machines and then uh, doing puppets on them. Uh, my main point is that uh, any regression testing must also be distrib distributed because we can't do it centrally. Uh, we don't have access to all of the all of the sites and and uh, environments. That brings me on to the uh, the third part, uh, which may or may not be the most interesting for you, depending on who you are. Uh, as I said, we have to serve thousands of clients, uh, and since we also uh, 
are responsible for helping the deployment of, of new uh, Puppet installations, we also said that, well, we're not going to do the uh, installation by hand. We're going to have Puppet manifests for deploying Puppet. Uh, and of course, the, the, the platform has to support the way of working. And that's the same slide again. <clears throat> so to, how do we de deploy Puppet? Uh, well, uh, first of all, there's a, there's a global network uh, file system, uh, which is it's based on NFS uh, and rsync, keeping things moving around there. Uh, on there, we have the, uh, a copy of the, these Git repositories. Uh, and also all of the, the packages that are needed for this, because uh, as I said, although they have satellites, uh, they have, may have uh, several different satellites. So you still have to load your satellite. If you have a lot of Red Hat packages, you have to load your satellite with packages from somewhere. So they are in this uh, uh, global uh, NFS file system. Uh, so what you do is uh, you, you put your the packages into uh, satellite. Uh, you clone the, the code from the Git repo to your local and you test it and you change some parameters and then you uh, bootstrap your first Puppet Master with Puppet Apply. And from there on, uh, uh, they use load balancing by the way. Uh, I'm not sure really this is needed. Uh, the uh, Spotify guy uh, where is he? You had a lot of uh, nodes per server. Here we have we have a we have beefed up really. We can have uh, we start out by saying okay, we'll start out by having three uh, and load balancing, and uh, will will the the certificate in the CA will allow for up to ten puppet masters, which we can load balance between. We may have overdone it. I don't know. Uh, but to add another master, it's really easy if, if we should need to. Uh, you add uh, uh, the round robin uh, uh, record to the DNS. You add the server, obviously. Uh, you mount this, uh, uh, the shared storage where all the puppet manifests are. And then you bootstrap this server from an existing server by using puppet agent minus server minus CA server. So it's Good to have it puppet being puppet deployable. So as I said, three, we start out with three masters, go up to ten. Uh, one uh, CI server, it's only doing that. Uh, we have uh, to keep these uh, up to eleven servers uh, to have the have them share the manifests. We uh, use an NFS uh, file system there. Uh, obviously, we are using Passenger, uh, you too. Is there another one in widespread use? I don't know. Unicorn. Uh, and as I said, Roger will be in DNS records. Uh, in this platform, we also have Foreman. Uh, it's, it's really... Uh, it's great to have when you have a lot of nodes because there can be a server like forgotten somewhere. We've all heard the stories of a server forgotten somewhere behind the drywall of the because they rebuilt the data center. So uh, uh, when you have a lot of servers, uh, it's it's good to be able to see if any one of them have a problem. Uh, and we do this by uh, well the the, the agents uh, send back the reports uh, to the puppet master which stores them on the same network file system where the manifests are, which is shared by all of them, including the four-man server. Uh, so it's pulled every five minutes or something. Um, the good thing is that we, since we, uh, there are other ways of doing it, but the good thing here is that the four-man server, uh, since we have only one, it can be offline for a week or something, uh, and we will still not lose the reports. Once we start it up, the cron job will spool it into its MySQL database, and uh, we can see it there. Uh, the agents, uh, well, obviously, we have uh, several different ways of deploying operating systems. Uh, not, we're not using Razor. Uh, 
Uh, but we, I mean, the main ones are uh, Kickstart and Jumpstart. Uh, on the agents, we, we have standardized on version. We say we're using 2.7.14. Uh, and we'll compile it for you. Uh, since uh, there are uh, there are some who use actually use Puppet for other things, um, I won't go into that. But they can use the, the Puppet that came with the operating system. Uh, we'll install our Puppet uh, in a in a directory under opt, and it will be there e even though you uninstall everything and break the server horribly. The, our installation under opt will be there to bring it back to life. Uh, we run it by Chrome. Here's a, a controversy. Uh, there, uh, this is really a code standard issue. Uh, but this is with the, the Puppet files. Um, many like the idea that we would have a, a, well, now, great, we have a way of distributing files uh, universally with the Puppet masters. But then I said, no, you can't, sorry, you can't use it. Uh, why? Uh, well, I think the, it's, I know it's a little bit late for showing code, but I mean, this is the, the really re the reason why we don't, uh, well, the problem is uh, Solaris can't use anything but a file system to install packages from until version 10, where you can, uh, you can pull the package from HTTP, but the admin file and response file, you can't. So you have to have things mapped into a file system to be able to install packages. So that breaks uh, uh, everything about using something other than NFS, really. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you want Puppet to transfer it, you, well, you could transfer it locally to, to the local file system, and then have a pkg add pull it from there. But then you will have to write some code for transferring the file. So this is uh, what you get if you use, this is all the code for installing a, a package that is stored on uh, an NFS volume. And this would be the code uh, if you also had to transfer it. And this is not counting the, uh, the custom Ruby, the custom uh, fact code that you would have to have to determine if you were, uh, if you should transfer this file or not. So uh, I'm, we're, we're going with this, it's easier. Uh, orchestration, we don't have it. Uh, I think most, uh, uh, the, the biggest reason for this is that we have so big change windows. Uh, we can say, okay, sometime during uh, the next weekend, there will be a change. So why, why would you need to uh, specify exactly what second we do the change? Uh, also, there is a, a, a lot of, in this organization, uh, even though we're, we stay at the same sites, the, the complicated network, uh, firewalls, security guys, uh, a lot of red tape to open a port somewhere, which kind of makes even having Puppet run uh, is a little bit difficult. Imagine that you can reach all your all servers on a port somewhere. They have to open like 100 firewalls. Okay, uh, almost right on time. Uh, what did we learn? What have we learned from this? Uh, well, uh, the first thing is something that we didn't learn here. Uh, actually, uh, I, I, it was learned elsewhere. Uh, but I'm really glad that we uh, uh, brought this with us. Uh, because uh, modules, uh, we, we try to avoid having modules depend on modules. Because, uh, as I said, we have each module uh, in a different Git repo. And all of the sites can pick and mix uh, their modules as they see fit. So they, okay, we, we, there's a new feature in this module. Okay, I'll take this module, but only this module. I won't upgrade all my other modules. So uh, to, to avoid a lot of uh, the regression testing, a, a lot of regression testing, then uh, we have modules that, well, 
you can take just one module and use it, and it will be fine, as long as that module works. Another thing uh, that is, uh, we, this is uh, something that is, uh, can be difficult. Uh, it's, I, I used to say it's never too late to give up. When you have invested a lot of time writing a very complicated puppet module, a big chain of XX to install something with a, something nasty with a, like a Java installer, which release a GUI, something like that. Uh, give up. Puppet is not for everything. Uh, what we can do is have a, a guy who is good at this thing write the shell script, which we can shoot out as a template and let the shell script install it because Shell scripts are much, much better at doing sequential uh, 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 determined uh, executions. Uh, also, uh, well, the packages have, they have understood this. I mean, that's why they have a, a pre and a post and the, uh, uninstallation scripts in them. RPM has, uh, Debian has, PK, PKG has. Uh, so, uh, if it's too complicated, uh, if you have had like five different people look at the same module, trying to rewrite it, and it still doesn't work, give up. Do it with the shell script instead. Uh, but one thing we have really learned is that the, the biggest issues are with people. Uh, when we uh, when we come to a big organization uh, like this. What they have a lot of is people. Uh, and all these people will have different expectations of, of what we're trying to do. Uh, uh, we'll explain to them what, what Puppet is, and they say, oh, great. Uh, and then they think that uh, uh, once you have done, created a Puppet module for something that is a turnkey solution, which they can just give to a, Anyone, maybe not even a sysadmin, maybe a guy from, uh, from the cleaning department, give the puppet module to him and he'll deploy the system. And that's not it. That's not what we built. Uh, what we've done is, uh, Puppet is a tool for system administrators. You can't really replace them. You can, but only under very controlled circumstances and with a lot of testing. Uh, and there's also uh, even uh, within the, the system administration community as, at this organization, there's endless discussions of everything uh, from way of working to what, what should variables be named. Should we use uppercase, lowercase, underscore, things like that. Uh, be prepared for this if you ever uh, try to do something like this. I think that's it. Questions? Or applause as well. <laughs> <laughs>